This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about Bitcoin UTXO set bloat versus op returns. The UTXO set, UTXO just stands for unspent transaction output. And it's really just all the chunks of Bitcoin that can still be spent in the future and nodes need to store this. Op return is the place in Bitcoin transactions that was created specifically for arbitrary non-monetary data. And I want to do this video by responding to Bram's tweet here. He writes, please enlighten me. Why is it not better to push spam idiots to op returns versus worse bloating UTXOs? There will always be people who want to spam the chain. Moronic, absolutely. Now what? Why doesn't anyone understand that NFTs on Bitcoin have failed? So I wanted to address some of these concerns. And here and throughout this video, please understand that I'm not attacking, that I am attacking ideas and I'm not attacking Bram himself. Bram seems like a good guy and I appreciate him asking these questions. I thought it's a fruitful discussion. So let's begin with this question. Maybe it's a rhetorical question, but I'll treat it as a real question. Why is it not better to push spam idiots to op return versus worse bloating UTXOs? I think that's a little bit like debating whether it's better to put needle boxes in parks for heroin addicts or not. It's kind of this typical left-wing harm reduction framing, which I don't like. And again, here I'm criticizing Bitcoin Core and the way they framed it. I'm not criticizing Bram. But I do think this really reeks of this sort of harm reduction language that sidesteps the real issue at hand, because maybe the solution is not needle boxes in parks. Maybe the solution is just to keep heroin addicts out of your children's parks. And maybe the solution is to put families and kids ahead of heroin addicts, however sad it might be to be a heroin addict. It's a radical idea, but it might actually work. And likewise in Bitcoin, maybe the best solution is to do what Bitcoiners did in 2014 during the Opportune Wars to make it really clear as a community that spammers are not welcome in Bitcoin. Of course, this involves Bitcoiners actually being willing to offend their Bitcoiner friends and colleagues if necessary for the sake of Bitcoin. And people could start by boycotting, for example, everything that David Bailey touches. He's already wrecked so many people with his disastrous Naka, Kinley, Nakamoto venture. But if you actually if you actually hate spam, you should call out and boycott Bailey's conferences and magazine because he's been giving spammers a platform for over two years and even investing in their companies like Taproot Wizards through his company, UTXO Management. People like Adam Back like to keep saying on X, trust me, I really, really hate spam. I invented Hashcash. But I guess they don't hate it enough to actually do something about it in real life, since, for example, Adam invested in Bailey's Nakamoto. So that's the first step, having the cojones to call out the spammers and scammers, even if it means you miss out on the latest pipe deal, heaven forbid. Bitcoiners drove Vitalik out of Bitcoin and forced him to create his own blockchain for a scam. And that's what we should be doing today to spammers and scammers, rather than giving them respect on X and a platform at conferences. This is the tweet I'm talking about where Vitalik talks about the very earliest versions of ETH were on top of Primecoin. And Vitalik goes on to say they were not on top of Bitcoin because the Opportune Wars were happening at the time. This is a tweet from Vitalik in, in November 2014, but the Opportune Wars were in 2014. Uh, Vitalik goes on to write, given what certain core devs, certain Bitcoin core devs were saying at the time, I was scared that protocol rules would change under me by banning certain ways to encode data and transactions to make it harder. And I did not want to I did not want to build on a base protocol whose dev team would be at war with me. And the dev team, Bitcoin Core, should be at war with spammers if they hadn't been corrupted. If you're enjoying this video so far, I'd pause really briefly here to ask you to help to support this channel. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So now back to the original question, why is it not better to push spam idiots to op return versus worse bloating UTXOs? I really hate that framing, as I said, but here it goes. Even if you push op returns on people, some spam idiots will still use inscriptions. In fact, many spam idiots probably will use inscriptions because they get the 75% witness desk discount, which is a result of SegWit. These people will also dump their garbage in op returns. They'll use the witness place for data and they'll also use uh, op returns. Here's an amazing fact. If you allow more data in op returns, people will put more data in op returns. If you have two garbage cans and you make one garbage can wider, for example, blowing open op return from 83 bytes to 100,000 bytes, if you have two garbage cans and you make one garbage can wider without making the other garbage can smaller, in other words, the inscriptions garbage can, you are going to get more garbage. And a hat tip to Nick Zobel there for that analogy. Now, who else might put stuff in op returns or might want to put stuff in op returns? 
intel agencies, rogue regulators, rogue politicians, regular politicians, other bad actors. I think it's really a rookie mistake to assume that all bad actors are purely economically motivated and will always choose a solution that has the lowest transaction fee, like inscriptions, which get that 75% discount. Maybe some bad actors actually don't care about lower fees since they can create more disruption by putting stuff in op returns. Or maybe they don't know how to do inscriptions, but they do know how to do op return spam. Or maybe bad actors have a money printer, so they don't care about the cost of fees at all. They're just going to put the data, the bad data everywhere. And there are many, many bad actors in the world. And I think it's a mistake to assume that each of them is a homo economicus who behaves like some idealized actor on a college economics exam. This is how a lot of these people talk. This is how Bitcoin Core devs talk about this. They're like ivory tower idiots who don't understand the real world. Bram goes on to ask, why doesn't anyone understand that NFTs, I think he's referring to inscriptions on Bitcoin, why NFTs on Bitcoin have failed? My response, yes, people have lost massive amounts of money on these things, even after people like David Bailey and the Taproot Wizards were pushing them hard, but people got wrecked by these as well. Most of them are down 99% in price, but there's still a sucker, unfortunately, born every minute. We see this in crypto and shipcoin arenas. There's still a sucker born every minute. And lots of these things, lots of these inscriptions, these Bitcoin NFTs are still being mined every day and every hour. In fact, this is not something we need on the blockchain. Bram goes on to write, can we stop them? No. And my response to that would be, why so defeatist? Maybe we can't stop some individual somewhere steganographically embedding something deep in Bitcoin. But that's not the real problem here. The real problem is crypto startups and large projects, large, many of them Bitcoin affinity scams, spamming the chain. Large projects and startups are easy to identify, and we can make life really difficult for them by running knots and filtering their garbage from our mempools and refusing to relay it. They may change their opcode settings or however they do it, but we can immediately adjust our mempool filters to block them in real time. This just takes two minutes to do. And if you do this a few times to a few startups, a few crypto startups or Bitcoin affinity scams, you will end up scaring every single crypto VC and they will stop funding startups like these and instead go to Solana or Ethereum where there's not the same community hostility. This is the same playbook we used on Vitalik. So when Bram says, can we stop them? No, I would say, and again, this is not referring to Bram, but just in general, why are there so many weak men in Bitcoin at this point? Why are so few Bitcoiners standing up and fighting this stuff? Why are so many people saying, no, we can't stop them or we can't stop them 100%, so let's not try at all to stop them. Why is there so much defeatist thinking because of course we can stop them but to do that you have to actually try you should of course run knots which bram is doing as he said in his tweets and you should make your hostility to spam known you should help us also work towards a soft fork that will minimize arbitrary data on bitcoin and help us solve this problem also at the consensus level now utxo set bloat is bad as bram mentions since bitcoin nodes cannot discard this data you can't prune the utxo set as a node runner or you'll have no idea if a chunk of bitcoin can still be spent when you're checking transactions or if it's already been spent now of course if bitcoin core devs actually cared as much about utxo set bloat as they claim to care they would have fixed the inscriptions exploit back in 2023 before the UTXO set skyrocketed at that. This is the purple blue line here, and we can see where it really began, where the slope began to really increase was in the spring of 2023 when inscriptions began to be popular. David Bailey, Bitcoin Magazine, the Bitcoin Conference, Taproot Wizards, all these people were pushing them really hard, and it's been a complete disaster for the Bitcoin uh, UTXO set and the bloat. If you want to talk about how Bitcoin Core was asleep, at the switch when this happened. I'll put a link to this video, Bitcoin Core's Original Sin, in which I talk about how they basically changed the definition of data carrier size so they could refuse a PR by Luke Dasher that would have actually fixed this mess. Again, Luke Dasher was years ahead of everyone else. Now, while UTXO set is obviously bad, so is having lots of unnecessary data in op returns. Having large images, videos, and other non-monetary data in op returns does nothing to make my life better as a node runner. Large op returns do nothing to make Bitcoin better money, in fact, but rather they open up node runners to a host of unnecessary potential risks. As Nick Zabo talks about in this post, arbitrary data on blockchains makes them far more risky legally and morally to operate than with blockchains confined to financial transactions. 
running a node where one cannot selectively delete unacceptable content without wider functional disruption is also far riskier than running data services where one can selectively delete unacceptable content without causing wider functional disruption. And this is that idea, once there's a block in the blockchain in Bitcoin, you can't take it out, you can't, you can't prune out individual or cut out, surgically cut out individual transactions because each hash, each block is built using a hash of the previous block, etc. And then he goes on to talk about there's many different kinds of arbitrary content. We've talked a lot about CSAM and CP on this channel. He talks about other kinds of obscenity, copyrighted material, censored political content, trade secrets, classified material, and many other such categories which are treated in extremely different ways from each other by morality and by law. What's more, each of the th hundreds of jurisdictions over which a blockchain runs has its own variation. So this is the problem. Arbitrary content does not make Bitcoin better, but in fact, it makes it much worse and makes it much riskier for node runners. And if you lose the node runners, you've lost the network. Having lots of data and large op returns leaves me with yet another bad set of choices as a node runner. Do I keep this crap on my node? I really don't want to or need to. Or do I prune it? Because op returns are prunable, you can cut them out unlike the UTXO set. But if I prune op returns, then I can't run an Electrum server to index all my transactions, so I can't run a full Bitcoin wallet using my node. And that's a problem because the only reason I run a node is to use it with a wallet like Sparrow Wallet, for example. Now, if I don't prune it, then I'm storing lots of non-monetary data on my node that takes up space unnecessarily and could cause me different problems in different jurisdictions, as Nick was talking about there, due to, due to the arbitrary data there. So putting stuff in op returns is in many ways just as bad for people who want to use Bitcoin as money as bloating the UTXO set. I personally can always afford more RAM and processing power for a large UTXO set. Not everyone can, of course, which is bad for no decentralization from a global perspective. But many of us can afford more RAM. We don't want Bitcoin to become bloated because of Bitcoin core stupidity. Uh, and But given the trade-off, I certainly don't want to run a prune node either. I also don't want to store op return CSAM on my node in my home if that filth ever gets mined. So this is the thing. Bitcoin core has left us with only bad choices, unfortunately. And so many Bitcoiners will eventually just walk away and stop running nodes completely thanks to Bitcoin Core. I wanted to address the end of Bram's post here, where he writes, eventually, in my opinion, Bitcoin is money for enemies and technically also usable by enemies. That's the entire premise, and it should always stay that way. You pay to play, want to play dumb monetary games, you can try, but it will never be adopted on Bitcoin. I'm not sure I agree with that. And I have a video here in which I talk about, will Bitcoin spam get priced out? And there are many scenarios where it will not get priced out. So I wouldn't assume that. But here I want to address the question of Bitcoin being money for enemies, because this comes, this comes up frequently. And I think the emphasis on the phrase is wrong. It's not money for enemies. It's money for enemies, not arbitrary data storage for enemies. And I'm personally happy to store the history of monetary transactions that is the Bitcoin ledger. This is what the Bitcoin blockchain is, obviously. And I'm happy to store it, even if it includes a record of bad people paying for bad things, because you can't have global neutral money unless you're willing to store your enemy's financial transactions, and they're willing to store yours, so I'm fine with that trade-off. But what I'm not willing to do is to store unnecessary non-monetary data that's not needed for the strictly monetary functioning of Bitcoin. This is the thing, keeping a record of criminal financial transactions is not a crime. Keeping a record of them is not a crime. Storing illegal images is. In fact, storing those kinds of images and then relaying them to other nodes is the actual crime itself. So many people miss this. And that actual crime, it's called possession and distribution of CSAM. And that's what Bitcoin Core has enabled in their latest version with Bitcoin Core 30, which is why I call it a CSAM relay service. So I'll put a link to both of these videos if you want to dig a little bit deeper. But I want to thank Bram for that post and for inspiring this video. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.